So today, this is going to be the last bit of new content for you, right? Before the midterm next week. <clears throat> We're going to talk about sleep and biological rhythms. Now, I know some of you are going to think uh, sleep is clearly not a behavior, right? Uh, and, and the title of the book is Physiology of Behavior. Physiological psychology, we're talking about the connections between brains and behavior, right? But I really want you to think about sleep as a behavior. You're doing stuff while you are asleep, right? Uh, uh, if you don't believe me, ask for those of you that have someone else in the bed with you. Ask them if you do stuff uh, while you asleep. Not everybody, JP, has someone else in the bed with them for different reasons. Uh, but that happens, right? So you move about, that other person can answer to that. <clears throat> You may be one of the people who thinks, I don't do anything, but I know that other person does. Because every night I wake up and I have lost all of the blankets that I had, had previously had. Right? I don't know if anybody's in that situation. It happened, right? <clears throat> Your dog gets in there and just takes all those blankets from you. So uh, it just, just happens to you. Don't worry about it. There are things you can do. You can like tie the blankets down to those handles on your mattress. It's always effective. <clears throat> Practical tips. So, we're going to talk about what is sleep. We're going to talk about why we sleep. That's going to be interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about some physiological mechanisms of sleep and waking. We will talk a little bit about disorders of sleep, right? We're not going to talk a whole lot about disorders of sleep, but we'll talk about a few that are interesting. And then we're going to sort of finish up this chapter talking about biological clocks. <clears throat> Those are like those potato clocks that you have. Anybody ever made one of those? You guys have never made a potato clock? So you can use potatoes as a battery, right? Because, yeah, don't worry about it. But you can. You can buy these little kits. <clears throat> you guys have Google. Type in potato clock. I'm sure it'll come up. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Why are we showing you uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the pineal gland? You'll learn later. Because we're going to talk about those particular brain regions. I'm going to get you started. <clears throat> so what is sleep? Uh, I love these definitions, right? So I love to include them. Sleep is a behavior. We'll talk about that. And it is definitely motivated by the insistent urge of sleepiness. Right? I don't know if you... Just, just right there for you, Cameron. Um, <clears throat> this is from the publisher of the book. This is not me trying to make a joke. I'm just presenting the material as is right now. Motivated by the insistent urge of sleepiness. Now, that doesn't really do anything for you, right, Morgan? Like, I knew that. I knew that before I took this class. Why didn't you give me college credit for it? Okay. We're going to talk about some things that motivate that or that make that sleepiness happen. What are the things happening to you while that's going on? <clears throat> but first, we want to think about stages of sleep, right? It's really important for us to think about what stage of sleep are you in. And most people think, well, I'm either asleep or I'm not, right? That's my stage. But there are other things, right? How many of you have heard of REM sleep, right? It's called rapid eye movement sleep. So we have REM sleep. There are other stages of sleep too, right? There are actually stages one through four. We'll talk about those. Each one has its own unique characteristics, right? It has characteristics in terms of what's going on with your body physically, right? It also has interesting characteristics with the activity that's going on in your brain, right? And so we can measure that brain activity, and we can determine which stage of sleep are you in. It's kind of fascinating. <clears throat> now, if you go into a sleep lab, they're going to set up a couple things. Uh, I always think it's interesting. You know, they want you to go in and, and sleep like you normally would, but they're going to strap all of this stuff to your face and your body and get a good night's sleep that way, right? doesn't always work. One of the things they will do is an electromyogram. <clears throat> We're going to have some electrodes on your muscles. We can measure muscle uh, tension, right? Thankfully, uh, during some stages of sleep, you are not going to be moving, okay? That's great, because if you were moving, you might be acting out those dreams that you were having, right? And as exciting as that sounds to you, um, it's not so exciting uh, when you run into a wall that was not in your dream but is in your bedroom. <clears throat> that can cause some problems. 
There's also the electrooculogram. This is going to measure electrical potentials from your eyes. We are not interested in retinal activity. Remember when we talked about the visual system, we were talking about retinal activity. That's not what we're looking for here. It's the eye muscles that are moving, right? And that should hopefully make you think about the rapid eye movement sleep. If we called that rapid eye movement sleep, then the other stages of sleep must be non-rapid eye movement sleep, right? So what's the difference between REM and non-REM sleep? Your eyes are either moving or they're not. Rapidly. I still move a little. <clears throat> Here's a weird picture of a little girl. Um, everybody looked at that. Uh, it, it is a very weird picture. This is a girl who is uh, hooked up to a few electrodes so they can measure the electrophysiological activity from your brain and then from your muscles as well. Okay. When we're measuring uh, brain activity this way, we call it an EEG, an electroencephalogram. All right, so we can measure sort of gross global activity that's going on in the cortex. These guys do not reach very deeply, so we're not measuring from deep structures, right? We're just measuring from the cortex that's on the outside of the, uh, or the outer portion of the brain. <clears throat> All right. Now, we want to think about those different stages of sleep. What makes them different, okay? There's going to be a lot of information that's presented in the, ne the next couple slides. I will sort of tell you what I want you to be able to remember, right? There are some key characteristics as you move from each stage of sleep as to what that, um, that EEG will look like, okay? The features of that, and some of those key features are going to be important for us, okay? All right, how many of you are awake? About what I thought, zero hands went up. All right. <clears throat> when you are awake, there are sort of two types of brain activity that you might experience. It's what we call alpha and what we call beta. <clears throat> Hopefully in this class, uh, you guys are getting beta activity, right? <clears throat> this is going to be fairly high frequency. Okay? It's going to be irregular, right? It's going to look like this. very irregular ups and downs, right? We're going to have increases and decreases, okay, in that electrical activity. Why is it irregular? How many of you realize that the world is irregular, <clears throat> right? The world doesn't come at you in predictable waves, right? As you look around, things are changing in some irregular, unpredictable pattern, so our brain activity is going to match that, right? Some of you slip into alpha activity in this class. <clears throat> I know because I can see the look on your face. Right? Alpha activity is sort of this um, relaxed state. It's still going to be fairly high activity uh, or high frequency, but it's going to be um, a bit smoother. Right? And so you'll still have sort of high ups and down, ups and down, ups and downs, but they're going to be less connected to what's going on in the real world. Right? to be more relaxed, okay? You've all experienced this, right? Hopefully. I don't know. <clears throat> Once we get out of the awake stage, we're gonna move into sleep. Sleep stages, uh, we have what's called theta activity. This is gonna be low frequency, so we're talking, you know, three, four, five hertz, something like that. Okay. That's gonna be stage one. Stage two is going to be similar, but we're going to have two cool features in stage two. We have what are called sleep spindles, okay? So you're going to be going along in kind of your smooth activity, and then all of a sudden you're going to get this sort of rapid burst of brain activity. We also have K complex. A K complex is when you're coming along, and then all of a sudden you'll get kind of a big waveform. We're trying at this point to kick in to some of the deeper sleep stages. Those deeper sleep stages have slower <clears throat> waveforms. We call those delta activity. This is anything less than about four hertz. Okay. 
So you get down to that four hertz activity, we're calling that delta activity. The big difference between stage three and stage four is stage four has a higher proportion of delta activity as compared to stage three. Now this is also known as slow wave sleep. It's your non-rim sleep. We're having very synchronized EEG activity. So what do we mean by this? This is this is really an Casey. This is an important con concept here. It's cortical synchronization. <clears throat> All right. So we can look at these two uh, EEG recordings. Right. We can see uh, here's the first A. And then we have line B here. What do we see in A? Okay, We see high amplitude, right? So if you were looking at this waveform, look at how tall these waves are. Okay, it's, it's pretty tall compared to this. We see it's fairly slow, right? If I were to ask you to count the peaks in A, you could go, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. If I said count the peaks here in B, I'm trying to do this, right? <clears throat> so this is much more rapid. So smaller amplitude, okay? It's got a higher frequency. Now, what does this mean when we're thinking about the activity of the individual neurons in your cortex, right? So what do we know about activity of neurons? Well, that electrical potential can go up and it can go down, right? It goes positive, it goes negative constantly, right? It's moving back and forth all the time. Now, if you're awake and you're about, Calvin, you're just moving around in the world doing your thing, okay? All of those cells are constantly doing different things, right? They're doing whatever they need to do, okay? They're moving up, they're moving down. They're not necessarily moving up and down together, right? They're gonna move up and down as they need to to handle the information that's coming in, right? Now, when you go to sleep, how connected are you to the external world? Very You're, little. Very little, right? You're not. So why would you need your cortex to be uh, responding to the things that are happening. You don't. So what happens is they fall into these sort of synchronized oscillations, right? And so what you will see is you'll have a bunch of cells becoming positive at the same time, and then a bunch of them becoming negative at the same time. And you have this synchronized activity. It's how you get the higher amplitudes. It's how you get the lower frequency. It's how you know you're not responding to the world. <clears throat> okay? Doesn't mean there's less activity in either of these or more activity. It's about whether or not the activity is happening at the same time. Are we moving positive together and then negative together more so or are we just doing all the little bits that we need to whenever we need to? Okay, Same amount of activity really, right? Neurons are still doing their business but are they doing it together right? in that synchronized fashion or are they doing it apart? Okay. <clears throat> And as we move through the stages of sleep, we get deeper and deeper and deeper. We start to get higher and higher levels of cortical synchronization, right? So here you are. This is awake. Here's your alpha activity. There's your beta activity. Look how desynchronized that is. Look at the low amplitude. Look at the high frequency. As you're moving through those stages of sleep, Notice the increase in synchronization. Notice the increase in amplitude and that decrease in frequency. At this point, down here in stage three or stage four, you're not responding to the external world at all, right? You're completely removed from that. And that's fine because guess what? You're asleep. You're not expected to respond to what's going on, right? Now, REM sleep is sort of an interesting... Uh, exception to this rule, right? 
So in REM sleep, what you actually start to see is some theta and beta activity, very similar to what we saw while you were awake. Right? So when you go into REM sleep, your brain pattern changes. Okay, That EEG pattern changes. You get desynchronized activity. right? And you get your rapid eye movements as well. You also become paralyzed at this point, which, again, is a great thing to do. You don't want to be moving around while you're in REM sleep. Because if your brain activity matches that when you are awake, that means your brain activity is responding as though it's getting some external input, right? It's not getting external input. All the input's internal, but your brain treats it as though it's external input, okay? And so if you were able to move, you would move and respond to the world that you've created there in that REM sleep. This is why some people have, there are disorders <clears throat> where f folks are not paralyzed during REM sleep. And this happens, okay? Do not try to use this as an excuse for your bad behavior, right? Okay. Don't say, I have a REM sleep disorder and I just get up and do things randomly that I'm dreaming because they will test you and see if this is true. But there are cases of individuals who have been um, acquitted of murder, like even something that serious, because they were able to demonstrate and prove that they were actually asleep at the time uh, that they committed those murders. <clears throat> Do not try that defense, right? And I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you why. <clears throat> just from a practical purpose, I don't think you can afford a lawyer good enough to pull that off, because that's going to really take some some legal finesse, okay? So I, I've just taken an estimate that most students cannot afford good lawyers like that. You're gonna get your public defender and that guy's gonna, you're gonna be lucky if he or she knows what, you know, rim sleep is, okay? So just don't, you know, if you do murder someone, try a different defense. This one won't work, okay? Questions about this? Because this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you more than likely to talk to me about cortical synchronization and how that reflects your your uh, EEG patterns. Zane, I mean, I was just curious, what what stage of sleep would it be considered like if <clears throat> if someone uh, kicks in their sleep or sure or they <clears throat> say move you know an arm or something? I mean, Assuming they don't have a REM sleep disorder. That can really happen at any of the other sleep stages. Yeah, at any of those points, you're gonna be you're gonna be moving, tossing, turning a little bit. Uh, you might even be mumbling some things. I don't know if anybody, uh, and I mean this in the, the like sense we're talking about today, sleeps with a, uh, a person who talks in their sleep. Uh, you know, it happens. People do it all the time. Uh, I had a college roommate who would talk in his sleep and just like wake up and like demand Dr. Pepper. Uh, <laughs> true story, true story. He would wake up, hand me my Dr. Pepper. And I'm like, just shut up. I'm trying to like do my homework or something. Uh, he's like, I just want that Dr. Pepper over there. It's like, there's, there's not a Dr. Pepper over there, I swear to you. Let's go back to sleep. Then I started giving him NyQuil. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I was doing that before. So, uh, yeah, so other sleep stages, you, you, you can and do move around a little bit, uh, but in REM sleep, you, you shouldn't be, okay? Now, sometimes there is a slight, and this does not mean you have a sleep disorder, so I don't want anybody to, like, freak out on this, right? Sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect between the washout of the paralysis and you actually sort of waking up, right? How many of you have ever uh, had... Is that often if you wake up like you can't move? That is a scary signal. It is, um, but it's, it happens all the time. Now, if it's happening like every 10 minutes to you, go see a neurologist. Um, if it happens to you occasionally, don't worry about it. It's, it's just sort of a normal process. Um, often, this is when people will think that they're like ghost elephants sitting on their chest trying to choke them. Um, people will make up stories about this, right? Riley, like, I can't move, so there's got to be an invisible person trying to kill me. It, it's happened, right? To you. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really pretty freaky because you're like, I can see everything, I can hear everything, but I can't move. 
Your best bet is just to try to go back to sleep. Um, don't worry about it. Don't freak out. It'll wash out in a minute or two. And it's not a big deal. But that's when the paralysis is still in effect. But your brain activity has switched back over to awake. Um, have most people experienced that at, at one point? Somebody has. We've got to know back there. That's okay. It'll happen to you. Just wait on it. It's a big milestone in your life. <laughs> uh, again, if it's happening to you uh, constantly, you know, I'd recommend seeing someone about that. If it happens occasionally to you, don't worry about it, right? Just let it go until your head explodes. And somebody else will clean up the mess. All right, uh, so this is sort of your... Uh, you know, a, a chart of your, your nightly progress through sleep. This is, you know, that mythical person who gets eight hours of sleep every night. Uh, <laughs> they don't exist. This is uh, based on unicorn sleep. <laughs> Just to let you know, it was, uh, I don't know, how many of you get eight hours of sleep? Nobody does, right? I mean, most of you are going to be, you're going to tell me you get four or you get 12, right? Because I think, I, <laughs> I think, right? That's where you are in life. Um, and that, that really doesn't change much later, I promise. So there you go. You might get, as you get a little older, you might get six, right? So hang in there for that. That's going to be fun. So let's assume, I know they base everything on eight hours, right? Um, eight hours may or may not be the right number for you. Keep that in mind, right? Everybody needs different amounts of sleep. I would recommend not depriving yourself of sleep. Um, you know, if you need to sleep, sleep. If you don't, don't, right? Um, that's the way it works. We'll talk about why you should sleep later. Um, and then for those of you who don't sleep, we'll talk about it again because it's related to your memory. <clears throat> there you go. So when you start out at night, and this is going to be charted over hours, you kind of move through your stages, right, to get down into your slow wave sleep. And then you'll just kind of pop back out. You'll pop into REM sleep, and you keep doing this throughout the night. Now what you'll notice is over the course of your night's sleep, you spend less and less time down here in slow wave sleep. Okay? And you spend more and more time in REM sleep. Right? Up until the point where you wake up. That's the standard normal process. Okay? I'm not going to ask you how many, how many hours a night do you spend in REM sleep. I don't think that's going to be useful. Right? But, uh, but knowing that <clears throat> you spend more time in REM sleep as you, um, as you go through the night. Uh, you start out, you know, here's just a few minutes of REM sleep. By the time you go through your second or third or fourth bout of REM sleep, you're, you're in there 45 minutes to an hour. Okay? This is a, one reason why you should. This is going to be something we'll talk about multiple times. <clears throat> you should try to get a full night's sleep, whatever that is for you, because you do want to spend the appropriate amount of time in the different stages of sleep. In particular, your slow wave sleep and your REM sleep. These are two different, and we'll talk about this again more later, these are two different kinds of sleep. You should have figured that out from the cortical synchrony issues, right, between slow, slow wave sleep and REM sleep. Two different mechanisms control this, right, and they probably give you two different benefits, right? There are two different things they're doing for you, uh, neurologically speaking. <laughs> <clears throat> For those of you that love charts, here's a nice little chart or table telling you what's going on in uh, REM sleep versus uh, slow wave sleep, just so you can have the nice uh, sort of comparison there. Again, what we're going to think about in this class mostly <clears throat> is that the EG data, right, the cortical synchrony versus desynchrony. We do want to think about the eye movements, that's how we get the names, and the muscle tone. <clears throat> this says no data for dreams in slow wave sleep you probably have dreams in slow wave sleep <clears throat> so don't worry about that any other questions no one wants to talk about genital activity Yeah. Does that, well, I mean, is there a certain amount of time to the other? 
so your your watch is using a different metric, right? So your watch is not on your head. So it's not actually getting it's not actually telling you if you're in slow wave sleep or REM sleep. Uh, the only way to do that is eye movements and brain activity. With the watches, typically what they're assuming is if you're not moving, you're in REM sleep because you're paralyzed during REM sleep, right? So that's going to be, now I don't know whether they call that light sleep or deep sleep. Uh, from our perspective, REM sleep would not be deep sleep. From the perspective of someone not moving, you might consider REM sleep deep sleep, right? So I would really check to see what that is um, so because it may be giving you you know, I don't know how they determine that. Again, if it's not an EEG or an EMG, we really, we're making an assumption based on your, your activity. Okay. <clears throat> That's a good question. Because a lot of people have those fitness tracker watches, um, and they will give you sleep data. But, uh, but the data it's giving you is not obviously coming from brain activity. And that's going to be the number one place you want to go to know what stage of sleep you're in, is brain activity. So if you could get one with like an EEG cap, that'd be awesome. Zane? That, this might be a stupid question, but uh, what, like what <clears throat> stages of sleep, you know, some people have dreams you can remember and other dreams, you know, other people yeah. never remember their dreams. Like, is there any stage <clears throat> that, that you remember better, or is that just different people? Yeah, I, I think that's why they had like no data over here, right? So that's that's kind of hard because when you wake up and you're like, hey, did you remember a dream you had? Okay, well, how long ago was that dream you had? Was that 25 minutes ago when you were in REM sleep or was that an hour and a half ago when you were in stage three? Well, I mean, you're not going to really be able to, like self-reporting, that's going to be difficult. Um, there are some interesting studies where they have uh, tracked, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on the methods on how they do this, where they've actually tracked like dreams people have reported from REM sleep, and they've been able to track their eye movements. Their eye movements seem to reflect that yeah, they probably were, you know, like dreaming that they had that uh, that kind of experience, which is kind of interesting. I guess if you were like you know dreaming you were at Wimbledon or something, and your eyes were just like moving back and forth, I don't know, um, or if, you know you were at a NASCAR and your eyes were going in a circle. I, those are like the only two things I can think about. That that I I mean so that's that's sort of my ignorance of their methodological approach there, but but there you go. But there are a lot of like eye tracking uh, studies and things that if you're kind of interested in that. There you go. Anything else? Anybody read the book? There's a great post office story in there. No, nobody wants to. Yeah, it's a good story, isn't it, JP? I mean, I guess I should tell them, right? It's a so stamps apparently used to be sold in a roll. I don't know if anybody like, right? So not, you know, I'm not, I'm not recommending this for anyone in particular, but I, I feel like I should throw that out there, right, JP? Because you know where the story is going, right? Oh, yeah. um, but if you're ever interested or concerned about erectile dysfunction, uh, there's a great way you can test for this at home, and it involves a post office. Uh, so you just go to your post office um, and buy a roll of stamps. Do not ask the person behind the counter to assist you. There's like a list of things you shouldn't ask postal carriers uh, and employees. So you get a roll of stamps, and apparently, you know, they have these perforations, and so this sounds extremely comfortable. Uh, you you adhere the uh, the stamps to yourself, and then go to sleep. And if you wake up in the morning and the perforations have been uh, torn, then you know things are working properly. You just can't figure out how to do that while you're awake. So there's not like an actual physiological reason you're having difficulties, it's psychological. So then that can help you, can help you determine who you need to go to for help, right? I mean, I can really save you a doctor's visit there. And, you know, and I don't know, but I, the way they're increasing prices of stamps, it might just be cheaper to go to two doctors. <laughs> so I don't know. So there you go. Um, Nobody's excited about the post office now. Next time you go in and you buy a book of stamps, you're going to think about that differently, right? The books won't work because they're separate stickers, and you're not going to be able to tell, right? So don't use those. They've got to be perforated. Uh, that is another way, you know, so they can measure, uh, you know, blood flow to genitals, uh, which would also tell you whether or not you're in REM sleep or slow wave sleep ask before you do that that's just that's just being polite all 
Ah, uh, there's a brain. <clears throat> Don't worry too much about that. Ah, so why do we sleep? This is a really important question, right? So we've kind of talked about st sleep stages. We've talked about brain activity. We've talked about what's going on with your body, muscles, and so forth. But we haven't really talked about why we sleep. We haven't talked about what makes us sleep, except remember that insistent urge of sleepiness, right? That really sort of vague definition. Um, for those of you interested in science comedy, I think that's like three of you, um, and that's because one of you counted yourself twice. Um, there's a competition they have every year where people have to take actual scientific studies and then like weave that into kind of a funny comedy bit for like theories. And one that was pretty good a few years ago was about why we sleep. And it was, um, we were sleeping because it was the only way that we could avoid our own personalities. Uh, we're able to, to walk away from other people, but the only way to get away from your own annoyance is to actually go to sleep. So I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, that's not the real reason we sleep, probably. But there are a few things to keep in mind, and we've already talked about these a little bit. You are doing a ton of mental activity while you're asleep, right? Sleep is not a state of unconsciousness. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, blacking out and sleeping are also two different things, right? I know at some point in your life you may think they're the same. Uh, once you hit a certain level of maturity, you realize they're two different things. So, so that's that's a, a sign of adulthood there. Hang in there for that. The amount of activity that you have going on is a lot, and it's very similar whether you're in REM sleep, slow wave sleep, you're awake doesn't matter your brain is still doing things right and it's doing important things okay so you need to let it do that do not think of sleep as wasted time right? it's important time it's time Casey you're paying uh, to your future so you don't have Alzheimer's disease right so the next time someone tells you you sleep too much you say no I'm really on a strict Alzheimer's prevention program and uh, I <laughs> it's a good idea right yeah. You guys don't think about these things. You oversleep for class. You're never going to oversleep for my class because it starts at 4 o'clock. Uh, you oversleep for a class, an 8 a.m. class, or, or you, know, you have some practice or something, and say, look, you know, I, don't, uh, this is, I, I just make jokes, whatever. So here it is. My grandmother just got diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and I'm really trying to not go down that road. So I slept a little extra today uh, just to help me. Nobody's going to get mad at you for that. I don't know. You guys try it. Let me know how it works. Fall asleep while you're driving. Tell the police officer she's trying to prevent Alzheimer's disease. It's probably not going to make things any worse, is it? I mean, if you're like aggressive and belligerent about it, Sarah, maybe. But if you're polite about it, I mean, they can't, you know, put you in jail for being rude. Right? Guess what? Sleep happens to everybody and pretty much everything, right? So things that are vertebrates, that means they have a backbone, right? They sleep, okay? Their sleep might look a little different than our sleep, but they sleep all the same. Now, when we talk about REM sleep, right, with its paralysis, with its cortical desynchrony, with the eye movements, that really only happens to warm-blooded vertebrates. Hey, what's an example of a warm-blooded vertebrate? Yep, all of you, I think, right? What's a cold-blooded vertebrate? Lizard? Who said a lizard? Yeah, that was a good answer. I wrote fish, same thing. I mean, a lizard is just a fish without fins. It's not exactly true. Um, but, uh, but in terms of REM sleep, that's accurate, right? So cold-blooded vertebrates are not going to have REM sleep. Uh, they're not going to have that rapid eye movement sleep. So you are uh, going to have REM sleep, right? So that's pretty cool. Now, a bunch of studies with humans, right, and sleep deprivation. So it's kind of interesting. What's really interesting about sleep deprivation is it's not really needed for your normal, like sleep's not really needed for your normal body functions, right? There's a difference between being tired and sleepy, right? So I want to just, tired does not always equal sleepy, okay? How many of you have experienced physical tiredness? Okay. 
that happens. No, Casey's like, I don't think that's ever happened to me. Hang in there, it's a fun experience. Uh, physical tiredness is, is different, right? Uh, fatigue, that's different than sleepy, right? Being sleepy is a different process. It's not related to physical activity necessarily, right? You can get sleepy if you just sit on your couch all day and play video games, right? That happens, that's happened to Andre, to people you know, right? People you might know really well, like people like you, right? Yeah, it happens, don't worry about it. Uh, sleep deprivation is, however, detrimental to your cognitive abilities. This is in the short term and the long term, right? This is not just like, you know that guy who's been awake for two days and forgot where his house was, right? This is the guy who never slept for decades and now is in a um, specialized retirement facility because he has Alzheimer's disease, okay? Because I, I, I'm serious about this. Not sleeping enough will cause you to have long-term uh, brain degradation, okay? It does happen. Because part of what you're doing while you're asleep is cleaning up all of the junk that you've created all day long, right? And, and by junk, I don't mean that metaphorically. I mean physically. There is actual cellular debris. There's debris in your brain that needs to be cleared out of the way. And if you're not asleep, you can't have that cleanup process happen, okay? There is the phenomenon of rebound sleep. This is fun. How many of you have ever stayed awake for two days and then slept double the night after that? Yeah, I mean, it happens. That's not exactly the, the right ratio there. But if you are deprived of sleep, the next opportunity that you have, you will try to catch up some on that sleep. Uh, you will try to sleep a little bit longer. This can last actually for a few days, right? Uh, rebound sleep can. So let's say you normally sleep eight hours, we keep you awake a couple days. The next night you might sleep 12 hours. The next night after that you might sleep 10. You might get down to nine and then you're back on your eight, right? So you're gonna kind of taper down. What's really interesting about this is there are ways, and these are annoying, that you can deprive someone of uh, REM sleep. And the way that you do this is you sit beside them while they're asleep, and every time their eyes start moving, you poke them in the side and you wake them up, right? Uh, and so then you wake them up, and you just keep doing that. You let them sleep their normal amount of time, but don't let them go into REM sleep. What's interesting is if then you give them the opportunity to just sleep normally after that, they will actually spend more time in REM sleep. So they'll try to catch up on that, because remember, it's a different type of sleep. It's a different mechanism. So if you're deprived of it, you're gonna to try to catch up on it and not the slow wave sleep, okay? So there are two different mechanisms. It's kind of interesting. How many of you love dolphins? Nobody loves dolphins, right? Have they moved past like the, like, like when I was younger, like dolphins were the animal, right? Like if you were concerned about animals in the world, dolphins, right? I think now it's like polar bears though, right? Is that true? Yeah, I think so. But it was dolphins when I was kid. It was all the people eating tuna out of cans, you know. And you had to get the 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 the, the dolphin safe. Like that was a big deal, right? I don't. How many of you eat tuna out of a can? There's a like. There's a difference in like a tuna steak, right? That's acceptable, uh, just from a culinary perspective, right? Not not necessarily from a like nice to fish perspective, but just from a culinary perspective. And then there's like canned tuna. Um, which is acceptable for your cat. <clears throat> anyway, dolphins were a big deal when I was a kid. Uh, but nobody's given polar bears sleep studies, so for obvious reasons. They have, that actually is interesting. I wonder about this, though. Uh, now that it's because JPI had this moment of thinking about where polar bears live, right? And I was thinking about their variable length of day, right? So now I'm thinking someone should do a sleep study with polar bears. And I wonder if they have problems when you move them. I, you know, I like went to the Columbus Zoo once, right? And I'm thinking, well, that, that's just a regular day. I saw a polar bear there. You think that's really screwing around with its, like, I don't know, right? <clears throat> so now I'm thinking about this. Morgan, I don't know what you're doing this summer, but if you're going to a zoo, hop right in there with the polar bear and get an EEG recording for us. I think you should find it, right? I think it's exciting. It's brilliant. It is. You don't, you don't see this often. So dolphins are super cool, right? 
So there was a, a study a number of decades ago looking at the bottlenose dolphin and how it sleeps. So what is something you have that a dolphin doesn't have? And don't tell me feet, because that's not what I want to hear. Because really a dolphin has a foot. It's just wrapped up in a fin. Um, I'm going to make a big assumption about you, and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. And if I'm wrong uh, and it's not your choice, then there are places you can go for help on this. I'm assuming most of you have a bed, right? And that's probably a standard assumption I can make about, about you, um, is that you have a bed. Dolphins do not. There's not a Serta mattress factory underwater, right? <laughs> like selling memory foam to dolphins. Okay. Unfortunately, there probably is a bunch of memory foam floating in the ocean, but the dolphins aren't sleeping. So, how do dolphins sleep? The other thing, <clears throat> uh, and this may or may not be true for you as well, when dolphins are, are moving about, there's always something trying to eat them, right? I'm assuming for most of you, when you're asleep, there's not something trying to eat you, right? Not something thinking like, boy, that arm looks good. Uh, I wanted a tuna steak, but we were out, and I'm not going to eat what's in the can, so I don't think that happens. But dolphins, on the other hand, uh, you know, they're constantly in that threat environment, right? So guess what dolphins do? They sleep one hemisphere at a time. It's pretty crazy, right? They put one, seriously, one hemisphere goes to sleep. I think they probably swim in a circle. Uh, I don't know. It's just what I, it's not so bad, I guess, because they're, they're like, there's not much off midline on a dolphin, right? So I don't think there's a lot to worry about. So here you go. Here's the right hemisphere. Here's the left hemisphere. These are EEG recordings. See when you're awake, if you're a dolphin, that looks pretty normal, right? Now, if you just look at the top line, Okay, we're, not gonna, we're just going to look at right hemisphere for now. What do you notice? Intermediate sleep, slow wave sleep, and then you're back to waking. Okay, that's cool, right? That's the normal process that we've told you. Okay, Slightly um, elevated amplitude, lower frequency, and then you get even higher amplitude and lower frequency as you're getting that cortical synchronization. What's interesting, again, is that's only in the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere is doing the opposite. The left hemisphere is staying awake until that right hemisphere wakes up and then the left hemisphere pops into slow wave sleep. So they just alternate. <clears throat> it's a pretty cool story, right? Now how many of you like ducks? Because I have an even cooler duck story. Yeah. So, uh, ducks do something similar. Celine ducks will sleep one hemisphere at a time. What's interesting about the ducks is they, uh, they will get into a circle, right? And so inside you'll have some ducks swimming around, and then outside you'll have some more ducks. Now all of these ducks are going to swim in the same direction on the outside, while the ducks in the middle are just kind of floating around. The ducks in the middle will actually just put both, both hemispheres to sleep. They're fine, right? No problem. The ducks on the outside, though, what's interesting is they will sleep what would be the eye for the inner hemisphere, right, or the inner circle, and they'll, they'll keep, uh, so that would be the outer hemisphere, right, because everything's crossed. So they'll sleep the hemisphere with, uh, that controls the eye facing inside, but leave their outside eye um, alert so they can watch for predators as they're swimming around in a circle. That's pretty cool, right? And then over the period of their sleep, they'll just kind of swap in and other ducks will come out. It's a pretty fascinating story. Think about all the stuff you could accomplish if you could sleep one hemisphere at a time. It's pretty impressive. I mean, you get like eight hours extra work a day. <clears throat> I mean, you can only use half your body. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's the, that's the problem, right? Because when you're like left hemisphere sleeping, the right half of your body's done, right? So you'd have to be seated, but you could still like read out of one eye, this eye. Um, you know, you could still, still read, you could still possibly write. Um, yeah, but you could type. Everybody types with both hands, right? You could still type. So that'd be exciting. Talking might be difficult. Probably have some slurred speech um, because you're only really going to be controlling like half, right? <clears throat> I don't know. You should work on it. So what do we know about slow wave sleep? It is essential for survival 
and it reduces these free radicals, right? So what are free radicals? Um, they're basically molecules that cause oxidative damage to your, your body, right? So they're going to get in, they're going to tear stuff up, which is going to be bad. And during that slow wave sleep process, you eliminate these free radicals. You clean that up <clears throat> so you're not causing uh, brain damage. If you leave these free radicals out and about, they can eventually induce enough damage to cause uh, you know, permanent loss of cognitive functions. Okay. So this is why you should sleep. You shouldn't sleep in class. That's going to improve your cognitive functions staying awake in class, right? But sleep when you get home and sleep enough. Plan your day. Cut out those unimportant <coughs> things you do. You know, Call of Duty 87, Attack of the Rascals. Um, I, I don't know. Because I think by then you're, they're all going to be in rascals. You know, those little carts, you get the motorized carts. I think about this sometimes. You can only go so far backwards and so far forwards, right? That, that's reasonable, Andre. And then at some point you run into ridiculous ideas. There is something called fatal familial insomnia. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Okay? This is not, so don't have a freak out like, I had so much trouble getting to sleep last night. That happens to everybody from time to time. Doesn't mean you have insomnia, doesn't mean a lot of things, right? Uh, first thing I would recommend if you're having trouble sleeping, uh, take a look at your diet and your behavior before you go to sleep, right? Um, if you're you know, get, uh, taking something before you go to bed that increases your activity level, like methamphetamine, it's probably gonna be difficult for you to go to sleep, okay? Um, that's just, just a word to the wise there. But fatal familial insomnia, it's a genetic disorder, it's an inherited disorder. Uh, there's progressive insomnia. The downside of this um, is that word fatal. <clears throat> um, if you're diagnosed with this, you will die. Uh, and you'll die not too long actually after you're diagnosed with it. All right, what about REM sleep? Definitely promotes brain development, okay? Most of you are getting on the tail end of that, if not already past that, right? So brain development's not something you gotta worry about, but some of you like to learn, and those of you that don't like to learn, you need to anyway, because you're paying a lot of money right now, right? So you should learn, right? So you can, at the end, you can get that nice piece of paper with your name on it that doesn't have, I mean, one of those pieces of paper with your name on it's gonna have a lot of this on the bottom, uh, but you're gonna want the one that's gonna have the signature from the campus president, right? Okay. They're gonna give you both, Zane. I promise you. But it's not a promise you're going to get this one. You're definitely getting this one, one way or the other. Okay? We want you to get both. It's not a guarantee, but we want you to get both. So, REM sleep actually facilitates learning, which is pretty awesome. Okay? So, this is why it's a better idea to sleep the night before an exam than stay up all night studying. Right? If you don't know it, Haley, by the, the, if you don't know what you need for this class by next Monday night, just go to sleep. There's no point staying up because it's not going to help you. In fact, it might hurt you, right? Because you might accidentally know more than you think you do. It's a possibility. And by sleeping, you'll be able to tap into that so much more easily than if you were staying awake. It also helps for you to sleep after you learn something. Like, not like while you're trying to like recall it, right? So what you should do is when you go home after this class, maybe just take a nap, right? I know some of you are exhausted after this class anyway. Just go ahead and take a nap, right? That insistent urge of sleepiness that comes on after two and a half hours in here, right? Just, just let it take over you. Now, not now, but at 6.20. You guys could even stay in here for another, you know, 20, 30 minutes, an hour even. They're not going to kick you out, I don't think. I mean... Campus police, when they come around to lock the doors tonight, if, if they bother to look in, they might think it's weird that like 15, 20 people are, are sleeping in this room. But, you know, there you go. Uh, so let's talk a little more about that fatal familial insomnia. What's interesting about this is, and not surprising, there are definite problems with attention and memory, right? Again, because we just went through this whole story about how it facilitates learning and memory if you sleep. They also, folks who wake up, they say they're always in like a, like a dreamlike confused state. 
right? So they're, they kind of have this weird sort of experience. Eventually, they lose control of their autonomic and endocrine systems. It's going to increase their body temperatures. They've got insomnia. Um, you, you lose the ability to control your heart rate, uh, and, you, and you have a number of problems, and then death follows uh, not too long after. We already talked about REM sleep rebound. Okay. Right. Remember, you said we'll, we said we'll do the greater than normal percentage of REM sleep if we're recovering, you know, from some REM sleep deprivation. Okay. Long-term memories. REM sleep. This is really again we're talking about two different mechanisms here. They're doing two different things. They both help with uh, long-term memory. Sleep helps with the consolidation of what we call non-declarative memory, so REM sleep is going to help with that. Slow wave sleep helps with declarative memory. Now we'll talk more about what's declarative and non-declarative memory later. You don't really need to understand what that is right now. Declarative memory are, is things that are um, you know, easy for you to make a statement about. Uh, if I were to ask you what's the resting memory potential of a neuron, and, and that's a something you can declare, right? Something you can easily say is negative 65 millivolts. If I say, um, you know, uh, if, if we go and I show you how to do something, if I show you a process, if I show you how to get somewhere, those things are, are sort of non-declarative type things, right? Um, if I said, um, you know, how do you, how do you tie your shoes, that becomes sort of a, I mean, you can, you can definitely describe that, you can talk about that, but you knowing how to do that process, that's not declarative, that's a process you can do, right? In action. So here you go. This is just a nice uh, graph. These are folks that had a 90-minute nap um, in this category that uh, they were looking at some kind of visual discrimination task. So it's non-declared. So basically, they give you a couple images, and you have to say, I, you know, I've seen that one before, or I've not seen it before, right? So you have to remember that. You have to discriminate between these two. Again, getting that REM sleep is going to improve that. No nap or only slow wave sleep not going to help you, okay? Not going to improve your performance. Here's a declarative task, right? Uh, not a big deal. Again, you have that slow wave nap, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have that improvement. For non-declarative, performance is the same whether you stayed awake or you took a slow wave sleep nap, okay? So again, this tells you the importance of getting a full night's sleep, so you can go through all of those sleep stages, slow wave and REM sleep. All right. <clears throat> so we've talked about why we sleep. We've talked about the, the importance and the benefits of sleep. Maybe we should spend a little bit of time talking about that ins insistent urge of sleepiness. What causes that, right? What is the, 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 the physiological process that is causing you to go to sleep, right? Okay. There are uh, some chemicals that control sleep. We're gonna talk about a number of chemicals and neurotransmitters that control the sleep process. Some of the brain regions that do that, it's gonna be exciting. <clears throat> While you are awake, your body produces a sleep-promoting substance. That's a shocker, right? And you're going to build up more of this substance the longer you are awake, right? So if you're awake for four hours, <clears throat> you've accumulated some of that substance. If you're awake for eight, then you've accumulated more. Once you go to sleep, you can actually start destroying that substance, <clears throat> right? You can start to deactivate it. Again, the longer you're awake, the longer you need to sleep, to deactivate that substance. Okay. <clears throat> now, because REM sleep and slow wave sleep kind of create two or two different mechanisms, there might be a secondary substance, uh, one for each of those. <clears throat> but that's something that uh, that some folks are still actively investing. In. But we will talk about the substance here in a moment: adenosine. How many of you have heard of adenosine? 
It's good. How many of you have heard of adenosine in some other format besides one adenosine and nothing else? Yeah, it usually comes with what attached to it, JP? Phosphates. Yeah. So how many of you have heard of ATP? Yeah, or it's less useful cousin ADP. Right? So that's adenosine triphosphate, right? We talked about ATP. Uh, it's made by the mitochondria, which are the... You guys are required to say it, powerhouse of the cell. Yeah. You guys learned something your sophomore year of high school. Huh? Yeah, I know. It's all over the place, right? The Internet's good for something. I don't know what it is yet. I'll let you know. <clears throat> so, adenosine triphosphate. You're chopping this stuff up, right, all the time. But adenosine is a byproduct of a lot of your cellular processes, right? So you're going to build up adenosine throughout the day, right? That's going to build up that insistent urge of sleepiness, right? At this point, I'd like to go into a hypnosis, like, lecture. You're getting sleepy very sleepy. Try to see how many of you nod off. <clears throat> Crank the heat up a little bit, turn down the lights, get a sound machine app for my phone, play some waterfall noises, get a hot glass of milk. <clears throat> Anybody drink hot milk? That sounds gross, doesn't it? You know what else sounds gross? Cold milk. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to throw that out there. All right. There is a, um, there, there's a mechanism we call the flip-flop. These are not things that go on your feet, right? Um, flip-flop, in this case, what we're talking about is, guess what? You can either be awake or you can be asleep. Celine, you cannot do both at the same time. You could try it. It's going to give you a headache because I've done that. I try. Go to sleep and be awake at the same time. It doesn't work. You are either asleep or you are awake. Same thing with um, you know REM sleep. You're either in REM sleep or you're not in REM sleep. You're either your muscles are paralyzed or they're not paralyzed, right? It's on or it's off. There's not uh, degradations in between, right? Okay. You're asleep. You're awake. That's it. These flip flop circuits, they're going to control all of those mechanisms, all of those things we talked about on that chart, right? All of the components of sleep, whether your eyes are moving whether you've got muscle tone, whether your cortex is aroused, whether you've got that cortical synchrony or not, okay? It's flip-flops. It's on or it's off. And if one part's on, the other part has to be off, okay? So they're going to inhibit each other, right? So there's this reciprocal inhibition. If you've got one part turned on, it's going to actively be turning off the other part. If that part becomes turned on, it's going to actively turn off the other part, okay? It's going to work both ways. Does that make sense to everybody? If, if you get nothing else out of this lecture, Morgan, I want you to know you cannot be awake and asleep at the same time, okay? Hey, there's adenosine. Uh, again, this is this neuromodulator. It is released by neurons that are engaged in high levels of metabolic activity, okay? Hopefully, right now, many of you have at least a couple neurons that are active or that are in some of that uh, you know high level of metabolic activity range. Okay. This does not mean you need to slow down on your thinking, right? Don't try to Cameron. Don't try to back off a little bit because like I don't want to go to sleep right now. Okay, you're not going to think yourself to sleep at this moment. Okay, so don't do that. Of course, that could be your next excuse, right? Like if you fall asleep in class, your professor gets mad, and you say, "I was just." You know, your lecture was so engaging. My neurons were at such a high level of activity. I had this massive rush of adenosine that just put me to sleep. If it's in this class, I might let you by with that because, Kyle, it actually applies to, to what we're talking about, right? Not going to work in your philosophy class. That guy's just boring. You know, <laughs> that's why you fell asleep. He was boring. So what are you going to do? Anybody in a philosophy class? No. You guys take a philosophy class? You have to, right? That's a rule. No? You don't have to? Yeah, because you did. You were smart and didn't pick a COLA major. Are you an exercise science major? Yeah, that's what I see. Look at that bright guy right there. The rest of you guys had to take four years of a foreign language. How fun was that? <laughs> Which language? You didn't even say it in your foreign language. 
<laughs> I would have been more impressed if you'd done that. Are you just now realizing that, that had you had a different major, you wouldn't have to take a foreign language? If so, I'm so sorry. No, no. I okay. Just... That you have to or you don't have to? No, that I have to. Yeah, I thought, have to. I thought it was ridiculous, too. I tell people that at every opportunity, by the way. Oh, me too. Yeah, and those are probably a waste of your time, too. I, I, I mean, it, 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 I didn't learn <coughs> very much. Like, waste of time. Especially in Spanish, I can say, like, <laughs> like, you have to think about that even. You can ask for a beer. Yeah. That's important. Uh, there, there are a couple of phrases you should know in as many languages as possible. Where's the bathroom? Can I have a beer? And here's my money. Don't shoot me. <laughs> if you know those three phrases, you'll be fine. So wherever you go, those are the things you need to know. All right. Adenosine build up, put you to sleep. How many of you love caffeine? Yeah, okay. How many of you take caffeine so you stay awake? How many of you take caffeine so you go to sleep? No, no. Okay. It happens. Don't worry about it, JP. Some people are screwed up. And it's not their fault. It's your parents' fault. I consider you me not screwed up. Oh, okay. So, adenosine, you've got adenosine receptors, right? Your neurons... You're awake, wow, you're going to be dumping out adenosine on those adenosine receptors. They're going to get activated. This is going to cause that insistent urge of sleepiness. Okay? When you're in slow wave sleep, you can slow down the release of adenosine and you can actually start to break it down. Okay? Now, you're awake, you've been awake for a while. Juwan, you're going to try that caffeine thing, right? You've heard about it out there on the street, people are saying it works, you're going to give it a go. So you take a little caffeine. How does caffeine work, right? Why does caffeine work? It works, interestingly, because it comes in and it blocks your adenosine receptors, <clears throat> right? So it's going to block those adenosine receptors. You're not going to be getting that insistent urge of sleepiness, right? Because your adenosine receptors are not going to be activated. They're blocked by the caffeine. Now what happens when that caffeine washes away? The adenosine's still there, <laughs> right? The adenosine didn't go away, right? So when the caffeine disappears, you better have a pillow ready. Constantly. Constantly building up. Yeah, your adenosine levels, if you're awake, your adenosine levels are always doing this. They're always going up. Right? There's a little bit of breakdown maybe here and there, right? Kind of this natural statistical process, right? Things fall apart. Don't worry about it. But you're constantly going to be dropping out more and more adenosine as you're awake, right? And once that builds up to the level that it's going to activate those receptors, you're going to fall asleep. It's even possible, right, that if you continue to flood this with caffeine, right, eventually you can get enough adenosine in there, right, so that you're going to get enough adenosine to activate those levels and overwhelm that caffeine. Does that make sense? How many of you remember those neurotransmitters that we talked about? We talked about these other ones briefly. Well, we didn't talk about orexin, I don't believe. But I know we talked about acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, and uh, we'll talk about orexin today. So there are five neurotransmitters that can control arousal. Now, arousal is the opposite of being asleep, right? Okay, so that's what we're thinking about here. Just wanted to be clear, we're not to that chapter yet. So next, like two weeks. So mark your calendars. So, acetylcholine, right? This guy is great at doing something pretty cool. It actually creates that cortical desynchrony, okay? So when you activate these acetylcholine neurons, you activate those cholinergic neurons, we get cortical desynchrony. What is cortical desynchrony? What does that look like on an EEG? It looks like this, not this. Okay? If your cortex is desynchronized, you're in one of two places. Where are those places? You're either awake, or there's one more place you could be. 
That's right, Kyle. You could be in REM sleep. If you are in REM sleep, acetylcholine's up, but guess what also is happening? You've got that paralysis, right? Okay, so that's going on at the same time. You also have another group of cholinergic neurons that are involved in the hippocampus. You definitely want your hippocampus rolling, right? Um, so that you can uh, work on those uh, memories and so forth. Not a big deal here. This is kind of interesting. So if you think about acetylcholine release, obviously in cortex it's very high when you're awake. Cortex is desynchronized, it's alert, it's ready to handle info. You go to slow wave sleep, you're going to have a massive drop, a fair bit of an increase when you go back to REM sleep. What's sort of interesting about the hippocampus, you've got a moderate level of acetylcholine release during the day while you're awake. Again, you have that drop during slow wave sleep. But who remembers that the REM uh, sleep was important for consolidation of memories? The hippocampus is that, that brain region that's handling that, Andre. Okay? So guess what? You see a massive increase of acetylcholine release during slow wave sleep, or during REM sleep in the hippocampus. So that's pretty cool, right? Kind of have those differential effects there and different uh, acetylcholine levels. Don't worry about this too much. This is just a rat brain showing you your uh, cholinergic projections. Uh, norepinephrine. Can't really see that very well. Coming out of the locus ceruleus, that's the blue place. Okay. These are also ar involved in arousal and vigilance. Okay. They are uh, widespread, so we're going to have norepinephrine in the cortex, the hippocampus, your thalamus. Remember, that's all about sensory systems. Your uh, cortex, uh, you know, uh, in the cerebellum, pons, and your medulla. Those are going to be involved in like heart rate, uh, blood pressure, respiration, things like that. Who remembers the other name for norepinephrine was noradrenaline? Right? So if you're having an adrenaline rush, then you're obviously going to be awake, right? So if you have a lot of norepinephrine, you're going to be awake, alert, you're going to be vigilant. If those levels drop, then you can fall asleep. Again, here's just your norepinephrine levels. We're actually measuring, in this case, the uh, firing rate, so how many spikes per second of cells that are uh, uh, norepinephrine cells. When you're awake, you obviously see high rates of firing. They drop off as you get into slow wave sleep and REM sleep. Then they bounce back up uh, when you wake up. Not a surprise, right? Nobody has an adrenaline rush while they're in slow wave sleep. Doesn't happen. That'd be pretty, pretty weird, right? Like all the like theme parks would go out of business, no skydiving. Like, I'm just going to go to sleep tonight, have one of those big adrenaline rushes. Save some money. Uh, this is just showing you the noradrenergic pathways, nothing to worry about there. All right, what about serotonin? Okay. Serotonin uh, projects, again, we have projections many places, thalamus, hypothalamus, your basal ganglia, hippocampus, and your cortex. Serotonin levels actually... You can actually see this, right? So you've got some serotonin levels while you're awake. They start to drop just a little bit, but then you see uh, sort of big spikes in, during the, uh, the REM sleep, right? So we need that serotonin there. If you start screwing around with your serotonin levels, uh, you can um, produce that insistent urge of sleepiness, right? So how many of you have heard of SSRIs? Okay. Those are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. We've talked about those briefly before. They're going to increase serotonin levels. Often they're used to treat depression, irritability, aggression, a variety of, of issues. One of the major side effects of SSRIs is sleepiness. Right? So if any of you know someone who's on an SSRI, they might sleep a little more. Okay. If you've ever taken an SSRI, you may have noticed it made you a little bit sleepy. All right, we've also got histamine, right? Okay. This also helps control wakefulness. Not a big deal with histamine. Think about those antihistamines that you've taken, right? Uh, and again, Adriana, even people from Canada can take uh, Benadryl and fall asleep. 
Orexin is the last of the neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about. It's uh, cells that release orexin are mostly out there in the lateral hypothalamus. Orexin typically has an excitatory effect. Right? So you can see here is uh, these are orexinergic neurons in a rat. You can see how often they fire um, action potentials, which is kind of interesting. If you're awake, they're going to be firing at high levels. If they're uh, if you're asleep, either REM or slow wave sleep, you're going to have low levels of orexinergic activity. What's interesting in this is rats who, uh, you know, they'll measure their activity. Rats actually have really high um, orexinergic neuron activity while they're exploring their environments. So while they're out moving about in a new place, uh, orexin firing is pretty high. <clears throat> right. So this is kind of a nice summary of everything we've talked about so far with all those neurochemicals. You've got your adenosine, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, histamine, um, orexin. It tells you what's going on while you're awake, slow wave sleep, and REM sleep. Right? It's kind of a nice chart. Don't worry about that slide. <clears throat> but this is kind of important. So there are a few places that we want to think about or things we want to think about when we start to think about what is, what is keeping us awake, that flip-flop circuit, right? So we're going to talk about the preoptic area, the ventral lateral uh, preoptic area in particular. We'll think about those sleep-wake transitions and uh, sleep-wake cycles. So this diagram is pretty simple, straightforward. We're going to take this diagram and we're going to build on it, right? We're going to add some levels. We're going to add some more circuits to it. And eventually, we're going to have a nice kind of full picture of what's going on, OK? So we have something called the ventral lateral preoptic area. This is actually a brain region that promotes sleep. So when this brain region is active or activated, you are asleep. <clears throat> okay. Your brain stem and your forebrain, those are brain regions that cause arousal, activation, and vigilance, right? So you're going to be alert, you're going to be awake. We have this mutual inhibition concept that we talked about. If your brain stem is turned on and your forebrain, then the VLPOA is not going to be turned on. It's going to be inhibited actively. Okay? If it's flipped, because same as a flip-flop, right? And your uh, ventral lateral preoptic area is activated, then the brain stem and the forebrain are going to be inhibited. So we're not going to be releasing those neurotransmitters. Okay? That's the flip-flop when we're talking about sleep or wake. It's that simple. But let's add something else to it, <clears throat> okay? Because these four neurotransmitters here did not include orexin, right? So we need to add where orexin comes into play. Orexin, remember we said that was an excitatory, right? So orexin is going to have an excitatory input to your brain stem and your forebrain arousal systems. So it's going to actively turn on those systems that keep you awake, okay? It holds that flip-flop on. Okay. How does it hold your flip-flop on? Well, there has to be some motivation to remain awake. Okay. <clears throat> and we'll talk about what that motivation to stay awake is in just a moment. But let's talk about orexin for a moment. They actually receive an inhibitory input from the ventral lateral preoptic area. So when that area is activated, we're going to inhibit. Right? So this guy can inhibit. Let's go over here. Not a big deal. Okay. Even if we continue to try to keep those orexinergic neurons 
pumping and excited that adenosine signal can eventually overwhelm those, right? And that's what will eventually uh, cause you to have that insistent urge of sleepiness, right? So the adenosine is going to build up and it's eventually going to cause inhibition of those. I'm just going to turn off your brainstem and four brain systems. I'm just going to remove that inhibition and then your VLPOA becomes active. And guess what you're doing? You're sleeping. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is just showing you um, adenosine, another chart to drive that home. If you're going to REM sleep, that can get a little funky because remember that acetylcholine level kind of has to shift and change, right? So just keep that in mind. That acetylcholine is going to be high when you're awake. It's going to be high when you're in REM sleep. It's going to be low when you're in slow wave sleep. What's interesting about REM sleep is your metabolism in your brain uh, is as high as it is when you're awake. So REM sleep, guess what it does? Does not help you eliminate adenosine. Because if your activity levels are as high, your adenosine output is going to be as high as if you're awake, right? Okay, so, it, so REM sleep's not helping you get rid of that adenosine so much. Uh, we do have to keep in mind if you did not have that paralysis, then your um, activity levels would also be high you would wake up and um, act out those dreams, right? Whatever that dream was. <clears throat> Again, we're just thinking about acetylcholine being able to switch you over to REM sleep. Not a big deal, and I'm not going to ask you about these sort of brain regions here. Skip that. This is your REM flip-flop there is a separate circuit that controls uh, going into REM sleep you know once you're asleep coming in and out of REM sleep I want you to know that flip-flop exists but I'm not gonna ask you details about it okay I do want you to think about though let's see, how these might work together right And we want to plug in this orexinergic neurons again and keep in mind what keeps that active are going to be things like hunger. How many of you have ever tried to, uh, what do they always tell you, like, what's the easiest way to lose weight? Stop eating late at night. Yeah, how easy is that to do? I mean, like, how many of you have gone to bed hungry? <clears throat> that's, not e that's not fun. It's not fun and it's not easy to do, right? Just stop eating late at night. You'll lose all kinds of weight. Yeah, I mean, I mean really. Like, like, okay, one, yeah, it may work. But two, have you ever gone to bed hungry? It doesn't work very well, okay? So I'd recommend trying something else. Just because. Hunger is going to keep you awake. Why would hunger keep you awake? What could happen if you fell asleep and you were hungry? You could die. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know it's pretty... But really, right? If you go to... Why are you hungry? We'll talk about this later. You're hungry because you're at some deficit of nutrients or calories or whatever, right? And if you go to sleep, guess what you're not doing? You're not filling that need, and that need could become fatal while you're asleep. Right? You don't know that it's not going to happen. So what should you do? Well, you should stay awake and you should go find something to eat, right? That's why you're hungry. The other thing that will keep you awake is your biological time of day, right? So, so what is that biological clock telling you? <clears throat> Is it telling you the sun is out? And we'll talk about uh, your hypothalamus and, and uh, uh, circadian rhythms in a bit. It's kind of interesting stories there. But if you're getting those signals that keep you awake, right? How many of you have ever tried to sleep? Um, how many of you have room darkening curtains? Yeah, there you go, right? Why'd you get those? They help you sleep, right? Because they block out the sun. When the sun comes in, you're like, oh, it's time to get up. That's what your brain and your hormones are telling you. Right? But your like, laziness region, wherever that is in your body, is telling you like it's time to go back to sleep because I'm not doing this right now. <clears throat> so there you go. Fun stuff. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to worry about that. And we're not going to worry about 
Well, this is kind of interesting. <clears throat> uh, when you are in REM sleep, right, and that brain region is turned on that's going to put you in REM sleep, you actually are activating these inhibitory neurons that are shutting down your motor neurons, <clears throat> right? If there's a problem in this circuit, that's when you will start acting out, um, you know, that's when you'll start moving during REM sleep, okay? <clears throat> we could talk a little bit about disorders of sleep. I'm not going to ask you a whole lot about this. Uh, sleep apnea, you guys know what that is, right? You stop breathing while you're asleep. You have to wear one of those Darth Vader masks. Um, I, don't know if, I don't know, you've seen those on TV, right? <clears throat> now they sell all those like cleaning machines. I don't know for some reason. I don't know, I, again, I worry about what shows I'm watching when I see those kinds of commercials. Like, am I watching something appropriate for me? <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, cataplexy. That's kind of interesting. Uh, that's when you have complete paralysis while you're awake. So you're just like, you know, walking down the street and all of a sudden you become paralyzed. So, hopefully that, that dissipates, right? Uh, sleep paralysis, we talked about that. Those hallucinations, these are those vivid dreams that you have just prior to going to sleep, right? These are the ones where you think there's like an invisible ghost trying to choke you or something. Uh, the reason for that is your brain is going to make up a logical or what it thinks is a logical story about what's happening to you, right? <clears throat> so if you're feeling something, you have to come up with some, some interesting sort of uh, explanation for that, right? And if there's nothing... <coughs> interacting with you because you feel like you're choking, well, then you have to uh, confabulate is the word that we use. It's a fun word. You're going to have to confabulate some kind of story about why that's happening. Sleep attacks. These are when um, people take swords to bed. No, I... Uh, <clears throat> Some people do that. I don't know. Anybody sleep with like a, a sharp object in your bed with you? It's probably not a good idea. Okay, it was like a pair of scissors in case you want to do some crafting at night. A big butcher's knife. You never know when you want to like chop up some salami in the middle of the night. You never know. You never know. Huh. So you just like throw the knife at them? And, well, that would be better than trying to explain to my insurance company why there's bullet holes in my pocket. I suppose. I mean, knife marks are easier to pick. Knife marks probably are easier to deal with. And that works on people, too. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> you don't say. Just tossing that out there. Uh, we already talked about the other stuff. Not a problem. Hey, um, again, we talked about there are these disorders where you don't go to sleep during, or you don't uh, become paralyzed during REM sleep. There's also sleep-related eating disorders, okay? This is not like your dad wakes up at night and eats a sleeve of, you know, like EL fudge cookies or something, right? That's just what some people do. Uh, these are individuals who will actually, they're, they're sleepwalking, they will actually get up and they will eat uh, and actually don't have any memory of that. Now this can cause some problems. One, you can get really distraught because someone ate your turkey sandwich. Um, and that's going to really upset, right? I mean, Riley, you got this great turkey sandwich in your fridge. If it's not there tomorrow, you're going to get mad. And you're going to blame whoever lives in your house because you didn't do it, right? In fact, it could have been you. Uh, some of these folks will, you'll, you'll put locks on your refrigerators and cabinets as a, as a way to prevent this. There are other things you can do in a moment we'll talk about. The other problem with uh, these sleep-related eating disorders is it's not called a sleep-related cooking disorder, right? So, Celine, someone could be like just getting into your refrigerator and just eating raw meats, um, which that sounds like that could be problematic, right? Because then you have to worry about parasites and illnesses and things, right? And so you got that to worry about, too. I know, right? Joanne's like, ah, I don't want that one. Uh, <laughs> trying to pick out which disorder you want. Sleep eating disorder, probably. I don't know, just like pre-cook all your food before you put it in the fridge just in case. Um, typically, they will give folks um, like dopamine agonists, right, topiramate, uh, 
typically used for anti-seizure, also used for um, migraines. Uh, benzodiazepines, that'll definitely fix you up if you've got insomnia. Uh, I would not recommend taking a benzodiazepine. I always tell people you should never be on a benzodiazepine more than six minutes. Uh, you should take it for like that freak out you're having so that you don't like flail around and hurt somebody and then that's it. And you should probably be done. If you're still on a benzodiazepine, I recommend you ha do two things. Have a conversation with your healthcare provider who's having you on that and then find another one. Uh, <laughs> because you seriously should not be on a benzodiazepine. It's not a long-term maintenance medication. It can cause some serious problems. There are too many people that, um, that, that, that are out there taking benzodiazepines for years, and you just should not be doing that. It's going to be bad for you in the long run. All right, who wants to talk about biological clocks for a while? Eight slides. I can make that last over an hour. Right, JP? You were in that class where I would do like two hours with three slides. Yeah, you never know. Um, so, we want to think about circadian rhythms, right? These are daily uh, changes, either in behavior, physiological processes, hormone levels, right? It's not a big deal. These uh, Zeitgebers, it's a, a German word, um, are actually the, um, the stimulus that's going to work for that circadian rhythm. Now, when we think about circadian rhythms, what's the number one sort of stimulus that you think about? That's going to drive these uh, these changes. It's the sun, right? So you think about the sun. For those of you that don't know, the sun is visible to us roughly, uh, you know, ten to twelve hours a day, right? And then for ten or twelve hours, it's not visible, right? Okay. So we're spinning around in a circle. I assume it's moving in a circle, but you got to pick a reference point somewhere, right? Uh, so maybe it's not. It's up to you, right? For those of you Copernicans out there, um, it's the heliocentric uh, universe. So the sun's there. You're spinning around. We see it. comes up every day. There's some seasonal variations. For those of us sort of in that middle chunk of the planet, those seasonal variations are not as severe as those of us, um, and, and we're not in this group, at the uh, either end of the planet, right? Because the planet's got a little tilt to it, and as it goes around, things change a little bit. Don't worry about that. Okay? Now, sun comes up. Great. Right? Things need to grow, like plants. I don't know, right? You need to turn off the street lights at some point. Electrical bill's going to go up too much, Zane, if you keep the lights on all, all the time, right? So, that's why the sun comes up. Uh... But there's actually a brain region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Supra means above, okay? And chiasmatic, who remembers that optic chiasm? Where we had that partial decussation, right, Cameron, from the left eye and the right eye? So this guy's just right above that, right? That's where it's located, okay? It's in the hypothalamus. And it's really interesting because it has, um, it's basically where your biological clock is, right? It is the brain nucleus that's gonna be sensitive to the sun coming up. Now you've got cells in your retina, that's your eye, it's pupil. You've got some cells in your retina here. Remember we talked about before, they go back to the LGN and then the cortex, okay? There are some cells that branch off and they go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay? And when they get activated by sunlight, they tell that suprachiasmatic nucleus to let the rest of the hypothalamus know and by extension the rest of your brain, know that it's time for you to be awake. Okay, it's time for you to get up, it's time for you to do things. You switch over your uh, hormonal release pattern, you get some other things going, you get up about your day and you do your business, right? There is uh, this thing called melanopsin. This is actually out in those retinal ganglion cells. Okay. It's a special photopigment in some retinal ganglion cells. I know before we had said photoreceptors are the ones that are sensitive to light. There are actually some retinal ganglion cells that are sensitive to light. This is kind of a, a, an interesting thing. It was a kind of a cool development probably 15, 20 years ago uh, that this was discovered. Now, 
what happens if you don't have that reset mechanism every day, right? What happens if for some reason uh, you have decided to put yourself in an environment where light levels are always kind of, uh, you know, kind of in the middle, right? We're not getting these variations up, up and down. What you would actually see is a slight shift in, um, in your activity. So this is actually with a, with a rat, okay? So the light comes on, they go to sleep. Rats are nocturnal, by the way, just heads up. That's why this is reversed. If this was you, this light would be on and these would be off, okay? This is a rat, so it's reversed. So when the light goes off, the rat gets really active. Look at all that activity. If we were to shift when the light comes on or goes off, then we have a corresponding shift in when the activity of the rat starts, right? So we see that it's tied to this light, <clears throat> this shift from light to dark, right? Be the opposite for you, okay? If we were to suddenly have the sun come up four hours earlier, you'd probably get up four hours earlier and start doing your business, okay? Now, when you put a rat in an environment where there aren't those variations in light levels, they're still going to be active for about the same amount of time, right? I mean, you're going to see... You know some activity levels but what you see is a slight shift from day to day to day they're not on a 24-hour cycle they're really on something that's about a 25-hour cycle and if it's not reset you'll just continue to see that activity drift over time right over the course of several days same thing would happen to you if we put you in a room you didn't have a clock you didn't have access to a, a timekeeping device you didn't have windows over time you would start to shift your activity levels a bit Right, just a little bit every day. Andre? <laughs> Jet lag is a slightly different thing. Um, but uh, but that's actually, it's actually a good question. It is related in some sense because you're right. When you arrive somewhere um, and you think it's going to be like later in the day or earlier in the day and then all of a sudden the sun comes up and you're not ready for that, it can be problematic. And jet lag is, is bad going one way but not so bad the other. I have two questions. Um, yeah. If you never return them back to where they your rack of chains, light and dark, you yeah. just kind of keep going until they just do things throughout the day. Yeah, so so it'll just continue to drift, right? So they're still gonna have, let's say, a twelve hour active period and a twelve hour inactive period, right? It's but it's not gonna be determined by light anymore. Right. It's just gonna keep shifting a little bit every day when that starts. Our day, because we're gonna have we're gonna know what time that is. And that'll just continue to happen indefinitely. Second question is uh, you hear Sometimes about athletes doing these weird sleep cycles where they sleep for so many hours and then they get up, they wake up and then sleep again. Yeah. Kobe Bryant was really big into doing that. He used to play basketball, so it's just like, is that helpful or is it detrimental? It seems like it would be detrimental. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, I think what made Kobe Bryant an excellent basketball player was something else. Uh, that's just that's, <laughs> that's just my recommendation. I don't I don't think like you know. I meant, I meant that specific part of it. I think so. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that. Some of these guys do some weird things. Remember seat belts for your brain. Um, so, so the the that's the interesting thing, sort of about athletes, right? When these guys have high levels of success in, in anybody, right? Not just athletes, but I think athletes are a great example. They're super successful, and you'll ask them like, "What's what? What did you do?" And then they'll 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 find something, right? It doesn't matter what it is, and they'll say it's a sleep cycle thing I do uh, that really made me successful at this. And, and you don't know, right? I mean. Did that help? Did it hurt? It might have helped if you were, um, you know, you think about sort of the travel schedule for those guys. And, and, you know, if you were used to getting, if you were on one of these kind of schedules and you were playing basketball uh, and you were traveling East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, you know, back and forth all the time, um, and you were constantly trying to get, you know, those eight hours of sleep at the same time for you, that sort of egocentric day every time that could be difficult. I don't. I wouldn't recommend it as a long-term strategy because again, you're not going to be going through those sleep cycles appropriately. I wouldn't think if you're not getting enough hours at one time. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Is, is, is don't don't do that. There might be some other things Kobe Bryant has done that you could emulate. He's got a few things you shouldn't, and that's one of them. Other questions? That was a pretty good question. Though. I'd really love to tell you guys about strobe lights. You guys want to hear about strobe lights briefly? Because it's a basketball story. Um, who, who is a basketball fan? Obviously, you brought up the Kobe Bryant story, right? So, uh, how many of you have heard of this guy, Michael Jordan? I, I know a lot of people haven't. I just 
if we need to look him up on Google for a few moments, you guys can, can do that. Um, obviously, very famous. Uh, what did people do for, of Michael Jordan? They would take pictures of him, right? And so constantly, I mean, if you've ever watched any old clips of Michael Jordan, right, like going up for a slam, flash bulbs constantly, right? Okay, and that didn't happen for every other player, right? Uh, you know, you're like, you know, eighth guy who comes off the bench for the San Antonio Spurs. Not a lot of guys snapping photos of whoever that is, right? Like, how did he even get in the game? Uh, <laughs> you, you know, somebody's taking a rest. I don't know, right? Um, and then he's in. So it doesn't really happen. What, what Jordan did is he would hire, when he was traveling, he would hire local DJs to come into practice sessions and have them set up their strobe lights while he was practicing shooting free throws, jump shots, whatever, right? While he was practicing because he needed to get used to those strobe lights that were flashing all the time, right? So that's kind of cool. So, But now there are guys who buy goggles. There are strobe light goggles you can buy. I, I know, Celine, these are exciting, right? And you want a pair. Uh, they had these strobe light goggles. And uh, like Steph Curry, he has a pair uh, that he uses. And so those like flash on and off. You can turn off one eye. The other eye will keep flashing. What's interesting about this is they, um, they claim, and there's actually a little bit of scientific evidence behind this, that it helps improve sort of your like um, visual memory and visual, uh, uh, you know, your ability to analyze a visual scene, right? So if you think about like you're in a fast paced game and your visual scenes are constantly changing, right? So you have this going on. There's this whole secondary like sub story to this about the guy at Nike. Nike had a black ops operation for a while where they were making things that weren't like for public consumption and these goggles were one of them. That guy actually tried to kill his whole family. He got up one day and went to, was like headed off to work for a meeting and like disconnected the gas to his house and like piped it back in through the HVAC to like kill his wife and kids. Uh, thankfully, they woke up and figured out what was going on and they're fine, he's in jail. Uh, and they shut down, interestingly, they shut down that whole division of Nike. And so now, there are some people who still have these goggles. They're made by different companies. Uh, there's some military applications for them, obviously, you could imagine how that could be helpful if, uh, you know, uh, soldiers in, in combat could quickly analyze a visual situation. If you can do that faster, that's a major advantage uh, for you and your entire unit. But, uh, but finding out who manufactures these, where people buy them, like the San Antonio Spurs have a few pair of these goggles, but they don't really... Like the trainers just say, yeah, we just have them. We got them somewhere. Uh, there was a big article a couple years ago in ES on ESPN's website. If you just type in uh, like Spurs stroboscopic goggles or something, it'll come up probably. Um, and it was really just like this whole interesting story. I thought it was fascinating. So there you go. I don't know. Anybody going to get a pair of those? I think we can make a pair. I mean, it wouldn't be too complicated. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that guy had going on. Uh, that's just like a weird. And then that that story just kind of like that storyline just kind of disappeared. Um, there's like a lot of interesting things in that story. You should check it out. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, super chiasmatic nucleus. Any other questions about that? That's just showing you where it's located. Not a big deal. Here again is from the retina. Remember those retinal ganglion cells with the melanopsin? Going back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus there, not a big deal. This is not new, right? Remember the VLPOA, the arousal system there in your forebrain, and brainstem, the erexinergic neurons. Look at this. This is gonna be light coming in. Don't worry so much about these steps. But look at this. When that light comes in, we've got a couple steps, but eventually we're going to activate those erexinergic neurons out in the lateral hypothalamus, right? When we activate those, remember that kicks on the awake state and it holds it there, right? Because we're going to inhibit that ventral lateral preoptic area. So this is how light will um, activate your uh, flip flop system. Don't worry about that too much. There are some people uh, who have advanced sleep phase or delayed sleep phase syndrome, right? These are folks who 
it is uh, nearly impossible for them to get up early, but then it's nearly impossible for them to go to bed at a decent time as well, right? So then they have to stay up later. And the other thing happens as well. There are folks who get up really early. It's impossible for them to sleep later, but then they go to bed really early at night too, right? These are not people who've developed this out of habit. These are actually, uh, you know, neurological disorders that this happens, right? <laughs> Don't worry so much about that. I do have one more story I want to tell you about temperature. Temperature is actually another uh, trigger for your biological clock. Okay? So there was a study a number of uh, years ago, two or three years ago, I guess, at this point, where some folks got a bunch of Fitbits, right? And they, uh, they found some uh, like hunter-gatherer societies, right? And they gave them these Fitbits to wear for a while. And they collected like tens of thousands of hours of data. Okay, and what they wanted to do is they wanted to see what their sleep wake patterns are. Because often people will say, oh, we, we sleep less now because we have lights we can turn on at night, right? I mean, you guys have heard this, right? It's like uh, before electricity, when there were just candles, people slept 12 hours a day and people were healthier, you know, I don't know, right? It was whatever. Uh, what they found, Casey, was kind of interesting. One, that's not really true. People sleep about eight or nine hours a night, whether they have lights or not, right? So that's kind of interesting. The other thing they found that was interesting is uh, these folks, they went to bed a little bit later in the summer, uh, like after the sun went down. So they would stay up after the sun went down, and then they would wake up uh, sort of, uh, yeah, so they would wake up a little bit earlier. In the winter, it was kind of a different story because they would wake up later in the day because it took more time to warm up, right? So um, if it's cooler, you'll sleep, is the point, right? So you have to wait until it's cool enough to sleep. If it's hot, you won't sleep. Um, I think the optimal temperature for sleeping is like 65 degrees. If you go home and set your thermostat on 65. Uh, no, nobody's going to do that. <laughs> Somebody is. Um, you know, there's science behind it. So you need to get your, um, your body at a lower temperature. So in the winter, these societies, they would sleep longer while the sun was up, just a couple hours. And then they would get up, right, once things were, were warm enough. Um, so that's kind of an interesting story. So temperature is, is a, uh, um, a signal as well. I think the, the sun coming up, right, that sunlight is, is a bigger signal, but the temperature can modulate that sun as well. Good question. No. I mean, that is a good question. Um, hmm. Yeah. How long do you sleep when you're hot, though? That's what we need to figure out. We'll think about that. Try with the heat next time. <laughs> but like really hot, like, but like so hot you're sweating though. That's what I'm thinking, right? Let's see if we can get it to the point where you're sweating and see what happens. I wonder if it's like a fatigue signal from fi uh, like maybe a different mechanism. That's interesting though, because um, you are right. Like some people do get drowsy when they're a little sleepy or when it's a little warm, right? Now I'm wondering if there's like some difference in the oxygen content in the air when it's hot versus cold. You should think about this. We can do a test. Everybody from now on drive with the heat on. <laughs> and then report back next week. Let's see what happens. All right, does anybody have any questions?